Gracious God, we come once again approaching your throne of grace just asking prayers for this world, Lord. We know that there are many things that are hindering us from just being healthy, Lord. We ask that you just bless us and guide us as you see fit. Lord, we ask special prayers for the churches of Christ all over the land country. Yeah. Especially those, those especially the Eastside congregation, the Lord. Asking blessings that you bless our elders and our deacons, the Lord, our ministers, as they try to uplift this community, the Lord, that we represent in Garland, Texas, the yeah. Lord. We ask that you bless Brother Ben Foster as he, as he comes before us, the Lord, to bring us the bread of life, that uh, we might take something that has been spoken, the Lord, and apply to our real lives, the Lord, as we continue to live in this dying world, the Lord. Amen. Bless us all, the Lord, as we go through the furtherance of this service, the Lord, that the things that we do and say might be pleasing and accepted in our sight. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But if God us with his hand, we'll follow till we die and we will understand it better. Bye.
continuing our uh, on our uh, uh, worship, and uh, we are so thankful that we can do it today uh, once again in a small group. But then we realize that we are also uh, thundering out to the masses. Those of you who are zooming with us, and we want to commend you, your audience, your your audience, as you are listening to the word. Yeah. And we thank you, oh God, for the privilege of being able to stand and preach the word. And we know that the Bible is good. And it says that in Psalms 100 verse 5, the Lord is good. Yeah. His mercy is everlasting. Yeah. And his truth endureth unto all generations. Yeah. And so we're thankful that we're serving a good God. And as we go to our text today, we're looking at James chapter 2, and we're noticing verse 8 through verse 13 for would serve as the hub for our text today. And the Bible reads, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Uh, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. Yeah. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Yeah. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Right. We're looking at a powerful text and it was written by Jesus' brother, James. And we do know that it took a while for his family members to come around, that is his brothers and sisters, to come around in the faith. Because John 7, 5 says, uh, even his brothers did not believe in him. That was early. But then after the death, burial, and resurrection, their faith increased, and it enabled James, the brother of the Lord, uh, to write this epistle. And he's talking about, in this contextual setting, about the law of liberty. You see, we are not under the old uh, ritual law of Moses that had 713 different laws that they had to keep. But we are over here under the law. We still have law. But it's the law of liberty. Yeah. The law of freedom. And uh, James talked about it in James 1.25. He said, whosoever keepeth the perfect law. Watch him now. Looks into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. That man shall be blessed in his deed. Yeah. So we are under this law, and it is based on two great commandments and then several other sub-commandments. But Jesus is indicating, even in those in the Old Testament, if they could keep those two, then it would be easy to keep all the others. Yeah, right. He said, well, over there in uh, the book of Matthew and uh, he pointed out chapter 22 verse 36 a scribe asked him questioned him and inquired and said teacher which is the greatest commandment of the law and Jesus said unto him you shall love that is the agape the unconditional love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto this. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two command all of the law and the prophets, which meant if you can do these, you can take care of the rest of them. And so we see that. So we are talking about then the second part that would lead up to our subject that James spoke about. Uh, he said in verses 12 through 13, he said, speak and so act as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty. So we are judged under this law of liberty, which meant that we got to show some love. Say amen. amen. For he who acts without mercy will have judgment without mercy. I want us to hear that. Uh, if we act without showing some mercy, then our judgment that will come upon us will be without mercy. In other words, uh, God is demonstrating uh, in no deposit, no return. In other words, if you don't put anything in, then you can't get anything out of it. And somebody said, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. I could use that for the subject. Say amen. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. But in our pivotal verse, in which we would draw our subject for today, is verse 13, where he said in the latter part of that verse, mercy triumphs over judgment. Now that's a difficult passage to some, but what I believe it really means is that uh, when you sin, you can get some mercy if you've been shown some mercy. Yeah, man, man. And even in the judgment, yeah. uh, we're going to need some mercy. Right. Now there are some people who say, well, uh, you know, I want justice. You won't ever hear this preacher say that. Uh, because I want all of the mercy I can get. Man, man. Say amen. amen. But I know that I'm not going to get any if I don't show some mercy. Yeah. Because the Bible says in Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. In other words, if you want to obtain some, you've got to show some. So that's what we're talking about today. And uh, I need to define that word mercy. And that is uh, from eleos uh, in the Greek is the outward manifestation of pity. Uh, it's a form of compassion and kindness. It's tender love. I like that definition best of all. It is tender love. Yes, uh, God wants us to practice what we preach. And that is, we've got to show uh, some mercy in order to Get some. So our subject in particular is judgment with or without mercy. Uh -huh. What we're going to try to show is the consequences or the results when you don't show any mercy. Yeah. And then we're going to show the consequences when you show some mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. And so when we look at it then, getting started with number one, we want to Recognize that we should show mercy toward the least of these, my brethren. Now, we are in the midst of a pandemic. And I want to challenge, uh, through the words of Jesus, of course, uh, this church and the leaders that we would look at. We have 50 million people out of work. And many in God. We need to study to see how we can contribute from this church in a time of great need, yeah. not only in this city, but throughout the world. Yeah. Somebody say, well, does that involve us? Yes, we gotta look in toward the food banks and other kinds of things that we can participate in Amen. so that we can fulfill our responsibility from Jesus. Yeah. Somebody yeah. say, what did Jesus say about it? Back to the Bible. I go. Now we recognize in Matthew 25, 31, the Bible says that when he comes, that is Jesus, and he's going to gather together all nations as he sits on his throne. And the Bible says 
He's going to separate the sheep from the goat. And the Bible says he's going to put the goat on the left hand side. But the sheep he's going to put on the right hand side. And as they're gathered before him, Jesus is going to deal with them. And uh, the Bible says he will say to them uh, uh, on the right hand side said to I was hungry and you gave me some meat. Yeah. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Yeah. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to see me. And uh, then they will inquire and say, uh, Master, when did we see you hungry and gave you food? When did we see you thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or in prison and visited you? And he said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these my brethren, You've done it all so unto me. That means we can do it posthumously. That is, my friends, uh, Jesus is gone. But he says that we are serving uh, through his authority and through his person when we serve others because it's so much like Jesus. When we are serving. But then those on the left hand side I was representing the goat. And Jesus said unto them the same thing. He said, I was hungry. And watch him now. And uh, you gave me no meat. Yeah. That was the separate, the opposite of the other group. Yeah. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You didn't come to see me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they're going to say to him, Lord, when did we see you in all these predicaments? He said, in as much as you did it not. Just watch it now. Just one word difference. The others, as you did it unto me. But unto these, as you did it not unto me. He says, and these shall go away into the everlasting fire. Why? Because you didn't serve the least of these, my brethren. And I hope you can understand what I'm saying. My heart is on fire today. Because of the fact that we have a great responsibility. And I believe this church will rise because we always do. To meet the challenges that are before us. And that are related to the word of God. And so, if you want to get some mercy, we're going to have to show some mercy. And then somebody said, where else are you going with that, Brother Foster? Well, there was a question that we want to answer in Matthew 18, 21. And the question was uh, from Peter to Jesus. He said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Yeah. Up to seven times. Watch him now. Because the Jews felt like Seven was the, uh, the, the perfect number. That was the holistic number. That was the number that encompassed everything. But Jesus raised the bar. He said, I say to you, not seven times. You are trying to do your math, and your geometry, and your calculus. He said, I don't want that. Don't try to put the arithmetic on it. Yeah. In other words... I, I say unto you unto seven times seventy. In other words, he raised the number to show that the number is an unlimited number. For as much as it takes, that's what you want to do. And he's in so many words, as if you didn't get that, he went on with the account of the unjust stood and gave that parable. He said there was a king uh, that uh, uh, went off to a country but he called his creditors and his helpers uh, to uh, call into account those that owe him. Yeah. And uh, he called one person in and 
he owed him 10,000 talents. That would be equivalent to about a million dollars. And uh, he asked him for payment, but the man couldn't pay. And then uh, he uh, threatened to put the man in prison and to sell him and his wife and his children and all his property. And uh, at that time, we know that uh, a person was worth 20 to 30 pieces of silver. We know Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. He sold him down into Egypt. You know all about that. But the Son of God, Judas, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. And uh, it would take a lifetime and then some for them to pay off even if they were sold and the profit and everything, it was a number and an amount that they could not uh, uh, challenge or they could not keep because it was too much. It was an unlimited amount. Yeah. So what did he do? He fell down before the king, the master, and begged for mercy. Yeah. And the man had compassion. He had mercy on him and forgave him the million dollar debt yeah. and told him it was paid in food. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, where you going, Brother Foster? Yeah. This represented the master. It was a debt we could not pay. All our righteousness couldn't pay it off. Isaiah looked down through the stream of time Isaiah indicated, he said uh, uh, in Isaiah uh, 64, 6, and I want you to go there with me very quickly, Isaiah 64 and verse number 6, and he gives us an idea of the debt that was paid on our behalf, and the Bible makes it plain there, and uh, he said in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing. And all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. In other words, you could stack up all of our righteousness, and it wouldn't do any good. That's what the Israelites ran into trying to keep uh, the law in which nobody was able to do it except Jesus. And uh, we recognize that they were lifting themselves up by their own bootstraps. But I'm here to tell you, it just won't work. And it was Paul who said in Romans 10, I want you to stay with me. He said, brethren, my heart is out. And proud of God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to righteousness. For they're going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Yeah. For God is the end of the law unto righteousness unto everyone that believeth. And so, thank God, we are under the covenant yeah. of grace and truth. Yeah. Remember Jesus said in John 1 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth. Yeah, yeah truth is grace is little twin sister. Say amen. <laughs> When you read one, you got to read the other. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so uh, the man left, that is the uh, servant that was uh, uh, served by the king and left the master. See, that's always a problem. That's why he's going to become a wicked uh, servant. Is anytime you leave the master, then you are walking away from Righteousness over into wickedness. Yeah, yeah. So don't ever leave God. That's where our strength is. Yeah. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Yeah. Whom yeah. shall I be afraid? Right. Stay with the Lord. We must stay with Him. Yeah, in Proverbs 3 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Right. 
We must stay with Jesus, stay with God. Say amen. amen. And uh, this man went out and he saw a servant that owed him uh, about a hundred pence. And I'm telling you, in that time, that would have been equivalent to about $25. And uh, now remember, the king had forgiven him of a, close to a million dollars. Yeah. And he went out and saw this man that owed him a hundred dollars. And uh, he insisted that the man would pay. And the man got on his knees just like he got on yeah. his knees yeah. before yeah. the king and begged for mercy. Yeah. And he said, no, I'm not going to give you any mercy. And uh, he began to choke him. You going to pay me what you owe. Put his hands on me. Yeah. Choking the man. You pay me what you owe. And if you don't, then I'm going to take it out on you and your family. Right. And the word went from the king's associates. And they went and told the king what this man did. And the king was very wroth. He came and had the tormentors to take this man and to deal with him and throw him out into outer darkness, so to speak. And the reason being was that he wanted mercy from God, but he couldn't show mercy to somebody. You all see what I'm preaching today? And so the Bible shows in order to get some mercy, you're going to have to show some mercy. Somebody said, do you have another passage that you can use? I'm glad you asked that question. Back to the Bible, I go. There was a woman in John chapter 8 that Jesus was in his Bible class at the Mount of Olives and uh, near the Mount of Olives over there in the temple and he was having class and they brought her up to Jesus and uh, and they had caught up in the very act of adultery. Yeah. And I often wondered, how did they know where to catch him? Yeah. And uh, I just believe that those old Pharisees yeah. <laughs> knew the spot. Say amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they caught him. And uh, you know, you got to be careful with that kind of thing. Right. And uh, I've always told people, uh, you don't have to worry about me trying to see who's under the sheets with whom. Because that's not my role. Say amen. My role is to preach the word. That's what I'm going to do. And so if you're all looking for me to be peeping around in people's houses, then you got the wrong man. I'm not going to do that. Say amen. And so they brought her to the class. And uh, I don't know, she may have been poorly clad and dressed and they took her from the very act. But it was a trap to get Jesus. Don't you see? Because they were trying to catch him up between the law of Moses and murder yeah. so they could kill him. Yeah. Because for the very fact that they brought the woman, but they didn't bring the man. Uh -huh. Now, the Bible is specific. In Leviticus 20 and 10, if you want to follow me now, the Bible says, he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife he said, both he and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Yeah. Say amen. Yeah. So if you're going to get one, you got to get the other. Yeah. But they were trying to get Jesus. And uh, listen to the Pharisees. Said now, this as they set her in the midst, said this woman. And they probably knew her name, probably knew it well. But they call him this one. Say, man, you got to watch those old fellows. And uh, this woman was caught in the very act. And, uh, and Jesus looked at him and he could read the hearts because he was not only man, he was God. Yeah. And he knew that uh, there was some sin in the room. Yeah. So he stooped down on the ground very quietly and uh, he began to write on the ground. And uh, Brother Keeble, the old great preacher, used to preach in churches of Christ. And somebody asked him one day, said, what did he write? And he said, I don't know, but those devils knew. Because when they read it, they got out of it. Say amen. That may have been. But I'm here to tell you that he got up again. And he challenged them. 
and said, let him that is without sin among you be the first to cast the stone. And uh, the Bible teaches that they began to leave from the eldest to the least of these. That would mean the youngest. And the eldest, the oldest, wanted to be an example because they knew they had some sin on them. And the younger ones knew they had some sin on them. And that reminds me now of Ecclesiastes 7.20. And I want you to look at that. The Bible says there's not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Yeah. In other words, we have all sinned, yeah. fallen short of the glory of God. It is only when we can be wrapped up in Christ's righteousness. We got to get out of our self-righteousness and put on Christ's righteousness. So when you see me, you are looking at Jesus in me. That's the only way we can have a right to the tree of life. We got to put on his righteousness, be robed in his righteousness, and his grace upon us. Say amen. amen. And so Jesus then, when they began to leave, one by one, the woman only was standing in the midst. And then he said unto her, woman, where are your accusers? She said, there are none, Lord. He said, well, neither do I condemn you. Yeah. He said, but I want you to go. But watch him now. He does not condone her evil. He said, but sin no more. Yeah. Cut out your devil, man. Yeah. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying here that uh, I'm not condemning you because of those that brought you in here. But the sins got to go. But uh, they were not worthy. To point a finger or to throw the stone because their hands were dirty too. Say amen. And so the Lord showed mercy. Can you say amen? He showed mercy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to move on. We've got to be careful. I'm reminded of a true story that happened to one of our preachers who got caught. He was tipping around on his wife. And it was a shame. And uh, they brought him before the brethren and said, uh, well, yeah, I know he was over at the house because we saw his car parked in front of her house about 2 o'clock one morning. But you have to wonder, what were they doing out there? And uh, he said, now, that's, that's how lies get out. And lies get out like that because, see, I didn't park in front of the house. I parked my car in the back of the house. Now, he was, he, he was a slow learner. You see, amen. He was trying to justify himself, but he didn't say his car wasn't bad, but it just wasn't in the front of the house. Amen. But you have to be so careful when you're dealing with things of this nature that would happen in somebody's privacy. Say amen. amen. Be very careful. But then, as I move on now, I want to show you in the latter part of this message what happens when you decide to show no mercy towards your neighbor. Well, let's recall the prayer of Jesus in Matthew 6, 9 and following. He said, when you pray, I want you to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, yeah. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He said, and I want you to know uh, that uh, lead us not into temptation, yes. but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Say amen. amen. And forgive us that part, our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yes. In other words, we got to show some mercy. And so I'm thinking now, over there in the Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, it was another parable of Jesus. And uh, it involved a Pharisee. Pharisees, they represented the largest sect of the Jews. And they were self-righteous people, but they adhered to the law of Moses strictly. And uh, there was also a publican. I didn't say a Republican. But a publican, say amen, just to wake you all up. A publican were, were tax collectors. Yeah. And they cheated in 
uh, collecting the taxes because they worked for the Roman government. Yes. So they had to give the Roman government its portion from their levies, from the taxes, but the excess they could keep in their pockets. So it was a, a, a part of thievery that was cloaked by the law. Yeah. And so, but then uh, this publican uh, had a, a, a religious consciousness realizing that he hadn't been doing right. Yeah. So he came up to the temple to pray. But the Pharisee was way up near the holy part of the temple and he was praying. And uh, you got to watch this person. People nowadays are using the word narcissism. Narcissistic person is yeah. somebody that always using the word I. And everything is about I, myself, and me. And notice him. He says, now, God, I thank you that I'm not as other people are. Yeah. That was his first mistake. Watch him in his eyes. And because uh, I, other people are extortionists and they're unjust and they're adulterous, even as this man back here. It, you see, point his finger back there. And you got to watch that. And he said, I thank you that I'm not as others. And the Bible says he prayed unto himself. Yeah. What I think that means is that not only was he isolated, uh, but uh, it may have meant, too, that God didn't even hear his prayer because it was too much about himself. It was a report and it was a boast about his own so-called goodness. Yeah. But he's not asking God for anything. And watch him now. And the Bible says that he began to talk about his excessive goodnesses. He said, now, I want you to recognize, God, that I give tithes twice a week. Now, that was not required by the law of Moses. But give tithes. And it was, uh, you gave tithes over your, uh, your increase, what came in, your, your, your money. But then he says, but I give tithes of everything I own. And not only that, but he says, I fast yeah. twice in the week. Now you got to understand that back in Leviticus uh, chapter 23, it points out very plainly that there was only one fast day. and That was the day of atonement. Yeah. But then the Jews had come in with some of their own rituals and added to the regulations and some observe Mondays and Thursdays. So he wanted to point out, I don't just fast once a week, but I fast twice a week. And uh, I thank you that I'm better than everybody in the room, and especially this one right back here. God looked at him, and the Bible says uh, uh, that uh, his prayer was not heard. He was not justified. But watch this other one. He's didn't even look up. He's so humble, he's beating on his breasts. Uh, his breasts, and he he hit on his chest, and he said in seven words, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah. In other words, I want some mercy. Yeah. I, I know I'm a sinner, and I want some mercy. Yeah. And Jesus said, the two came for worship, but one went to his home justified. What do you mean justified? He was acquitted of his sins because the mercy of God was upon him. God didn't like the attitude of the other. Zig Ziglar says that, you know, your attitude determines your altitude. How high you going to get, a lot depends on your attitude. The old Pharisee had a bad attitude. And standing before God trying to impress God about how good he was. And uh, this man that wouldn't even look up and the Bible says when he went down to his house he went justified because whosoever exalts himself shall be made a base but he that humble himself shall be exalted in due time. Say amen. Well I'm getting ready to close out here today. But I want you to know one other case that I want to put before us. And that is when Jesus was on the cross. And I wondered about those false witnesses that they bribed the old Pharisees and paid them to come up and to lie on Christ. 
But uh, you see, the devil is so shrewd yeah. until uh, he can fix a lie that can sound just like the truth. Yeah, yeah. Right. And they came up and said lies, these old false witnesses. They said, yeah, uh, he's guilty of blasphemy because we heard him say that I'll destroy this temple, that temple that's been 46 years in building, and I'll build it up in three days. Yeah, we heard him say that. Yeah, he's blasphemed. But Jesus later on would tell his disciples that that statement was made concerning his body, that he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So they missed the poem. Say amen. And, uh, and uh, they lied on him. But when he was on the cross, I don't know how many of them were there, but I believe the ones that drove the stakes in his hands and the stakes in his uh, feet. And uh, when you really look at the cross from the Old and the New Testament, he's naked. He doesn't have any clothing on. He took off that little apron he had and, and they gambled for it, the seamless robe and so on. But all of the crooks of there, those that nailed him to the cross, and he began to pray for them. 23, 34, and he prayed for his matters. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But there were two there, and this is what we're climaxing with today, and uh, two robbers, two insurrectionists, two thieves, and uh, one had a good attitude, and one had a, an evil attitude. And the one that had the evil attitude said, if you are who you say you are, if you are the Christ, then come down from the cross and save yourself and us. Yeah. And we'll believe in you. And then the good, the penitent thief said, his heart was right. He said, eh, do you not have any fear for God as he spoke to his fellow thief on the other side? He said, we're getting what we deserve. He said, and the condemnation we're getting you know we deserve it, but this man yeah. has done nothing amiss. God looked down on him and, and uh, he said, Lord, I want you to remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. And uh, the Lord had mercy on him, yeah. had mercy on the penitent thief and said, today, that's Luke 23, 43, shall you be with me in paradise. Yeah. That's that good place in the intermediate state, the Hadean world, as he wait the judgment. And I believe it's used interchangeably with Abraham's bosom. He said, and uh, you'll be with me. But then in the meantime, there are those that would say, this is what I've been wanting you to get on. Because it proves deathbed confessions and all we have to do, the grace will get us and isn't it true that this man wasn't baptized and he was not a member of the church? Yes, those things may be true, but then again, nobody can prove that he hadn't been baptized under John because John, you know, preached in Matthew chapter 3, and I know the man heard something about the kingdom, and he might have heard it from John's preaching because the Bible says in those days, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah. And so that means he might have heard something there, and then the Bible makes it plain that, uh, that all of Jerusalem and all of Judea and, and all the regions around went out and was baptized of John, but he forsook to, uh, to include or to baptize some of the Pharisees because he said, I want you to bring some fruit unto repentance because you generation of fibers, he said, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. Don't say that just because you are children of Abraham that you've got, got it made as far as salvation is concerned because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. But you bring some fruit, some repentance that is, and fruit and meat for repentance. And uh, this man may have heard some of that. He, he preached to all the people around the area because we know that he knew something about the kingdom because he brought it up. Say amen. 
But somebody will say, well, uh, do you believe he would be saved? And it is possible because the Bible says in Mark 2, 10, uh, he says, for the Son of Man had power on earth, that is authority on earth, to forgive sins. That meant as long as he was on earth, he could operate according to any rule that he wanted to because he's the Son of God. Say amen. And so, but then another thing we need to recognize to those that are trying to get around the plan of salvation by bringing up the thief on the cross, and that is the thief lived and died under another law. Yeah. He was under the Mosaic law, yeah. and he was not under the law of grace and truth. Somebody says, why are you basing this? Well, there is a verse in Hebrews 9, 16, the Bible says, for where a testimony is, that means a will is, there must be also of necessity the death of the will maker. We know that. If you're in the will and you want it has, you're not going to get it until the person, don't know, be trying to bump them off now. <laughs> say amen. Say amen. The Bible says, for a testament is a force after, watch that preposition, after men are dead, yeah. since it has no power at all while the testator lived. Right. That meant the new law couldn't go forward until after yeah. Jesus died. Yeah. Say amen. Yeah. After the blood was shed. So the man lived and died under another covenant. And if he's to be saved, it's not according to the covenant that mankind is bound by today which is the covenant of grace and truth. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, he knew something about the kingdom, but thank God we can know all about it today. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he told Peter, he said, and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And if you loose it on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. Thank God people were able to come into the kingdom on the birthday of the church, which was the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter was preaching and said in Acts 2.36, uh, he said, let all of the house of Israel. Why did he say Israel? Because there were only Jews and, and uh, proselytes uh, there in that great audience of about 3,000 persons. He said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard this, they were pricked or cut to the heart. Yeah. Said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the Bible says and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized and that same day there were added unto them the apostles about 3,000 souls. Praising God in heaven, favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church. Hey, I knew it was there. Daily, such as should be saved. Oh, the Bible is right. They obeyed that plan of salvation. And God bless you. That same God that added them to the church will add you to the church today. If you obey the same gospel, he'll add you to the same church. Isn't that all right? Oh, the Bible is right. And so the day is coming that mercy is going to triumph over judgment. And when I stand before God, yes, I'll have the ministry and all of the different things that God has blessed me and my wife and family to do. But I can't go on that alone. I got to go on the fact that uh, I want to hear God say, well done, yeah. good and faithful servant. You've been a servant over a few things. Come on up higher. I'll make you rule over many. Thanks be to God. And I'm here to tell you, I want to hear about a little message.
Say amen. To go along with it. To help me because mercy would triumph over judgment. Thank God for the word. And thank God for the Bible. The word of God. If you're here and you know you need to be coming, I don't know a better time to respond to the gospel than right now. Because the Bible says that the spirit and the bride says come. That is the Holy Spirit through the word and the bride. That's the church. And, and let him that heareth say come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What a great opportunity. And we want to sing the song now of invitation. And, and we want the whole world to hear and to know that it can include you when you are obedient to the same truth, the same word, the same gospel that saved 3,000. When they obeyed it, God in heaven saved, it, saved them, of course. Uh, on Pentecost, that same gospel will work for you today. God bless you and God keep you. When the Savior calls our name and say, when he calls for strength, and if there's anyone that uh, has been hospitalized by 
anything, Lord. We pray for our doctors and nurses, Lord, as they uh, try their best to uh, make the right decisions. We pray that you guide them and protect them, that the things that they do will be for the benefit of the patients that they're working with. We come asking special prayers, Lord, for all of those that may be traveling or uh, may be working, all the uh, first responders and those that uh, have to go uh, uh, in, the, in their workplaces and uh, be surrounded and put their lives in a sense at risk. We pray for them, Lord, that you continue to guide, guard, and protect them as well, Lord. We just pray for the East Side Church of Christ as a whole, Lord, as we continue to strive uh, to do your will, Lord, and to spread your word and to live a life that, is, uh, that, that glorifies your name. We pray for all of our leaders that you continue to be with those men, our, our elders and our deacons, Lord. We pray for them. We pray for all of our ministers and our congregation as a whole, Lord, that everything that we do, uh, we do, Lord, uh, in pleasing and acceptable unto you. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us for all the sins that we've committed in word, thought, or deed, and mission, and commission, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you allow us uh, to give mercy, Lord, as we obtain mercy. Amen. We pray, Lord, that you continue to be with us all. Bless us, guide us, and protect us. These are the thanks and blessings we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. is going on, God's church is still out there doing their thing. And with that being said, uh, we still have activities going on during the week that uh, you can participate in. One of them is our Tuesday, ladies Bible class at 12 noon by Sister Vivian Foster is hosting that. Uh, the meeting ID number is 843-828-348. And then your password is 655-283. Again, that's our Tuesday morning ladies' Bible class. You can contact Sister Vivian Foster and get on with that. Also, on Wednesday evenings, our youth Bible class, which is being conducted by our brother Antoine Hobbs. That's also on Wednesday afternoon, 6.30 p.m. Meeting ID number is 699 311 Four six four four, and the password is eight three six six one two. Again, that's our new Bible class, which is getting conducted by Brother Antoine Hobbs now, and also our Wednesday seven p.m. Bible class by Brother Ben Foster. You can contact on meeting ID number nine five nine nine eight two seven five five, and the ID number. Password would be 655-283. And the last one uh, is going to be the Thursday evening ladies' Bible class at 7 p.m. This is going to be conducted by Sister Linda Harris. And the uh, phone can contact the meeting number is going to be 838-8675-4754. And the password on it is 618821. And again, these activities are still going on. The church is still doing things that of God's word. Please don't forget, as I reiterate about your offering, your uh, communion cups. There are times dedicated and set aside for coming by the church to pick that up. Also, if you are unable to do so physically, you can also mail them to the Eastside Church of Christ in 2000, First Street, Garland, Texas. 75041. And please, last but not least, let us don't forget the ones that sit and shut in and pray for everybody during this time. God bless you all. Just a quick announcement. We would call them a call meeting for the elders this Tuesday night. It's not our usual time to meet, but we need to have a meeting. Uh, and we would like to have it here in the building. The brethren work that out. Maybe in the cafeteria we need to have an in-person meeting uh, at 7 o'clock this Tuesday. And uh, it will be zoomed around to the leaders with more specific details. But this coming Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock, elders meeting. Ready for our benediction.
benediction, we want to pray on that behalf as we stand. Oh God in heaven, we're so thankful again to be allowed and hear your word, Father, so good to be in your house of worship. Realizing, Father, that uh, your word is a priest, simplicity, 